In today's second reading, as we have just heard, the Apostle Paul says to the Christians in Ephesus, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And because of this, he admonishes them to live as children of light. For light produces, he goes on to say, every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. And how was it that these Ephesians became? children of light. Or more to the point, how is it that any of us become children of light? The answer can be found in this Sunday's Gospel, which has been interpreted by the Church from ancient times, at least in its spiritual dimension, as picturing for us the life of sanctifying grace that comes to us through the waters of baptism. But to understand properly the answer, we must begin with the fact that we are all born of the stock of Adam and Eve. And as a consequence, and as a just recompense, each and every one of us is conceived with the stain of original sin. We were therefore born into this world deeply wounded spiritually blind. Hence the healing of a man born blind in the waters of Siloam in today's gospel foreshadows is a type, a metaphor, if you will, of the sacrament of baptism by which we, by supernatural grace, are spiritually healed. Like the man born blind in today's gospel, in the sacrament of baptism we receive our spiritual sight in opening our eyes, we see Jesus and fall down and worship Him. In point of fact, in baptism, the guilt of original sin is washed away. Actual sins, if we have reached the age of reason, are forgiven and cleansed through the precious blood of the Lamb, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In baptism, we were born of water and the Spirit, as our Lord teaches Nicodemus. We were cleansed by the washing of water with the Word, by the washing of regeneration, as the Apostle Paul writes. Hence, baptism saves us, proclaims the Apostle Peter. Our catechism summarizes, through baptism we are freed from sin, and reborn as sons of God, we become members of Christ and are incorporated into the church and made shares in her mission. Baptism is the sacrament of regeneration or rebirth through water and the word. Thus in baptism, the life of supernatural grace and the grace of supernatural life began for those of us who have received this marvelous unmerited gift. No mere symbol or barren ritual, not just an ordinance of the Lord then, as so many in North Texas falsely teach or in ignorance believe, but rather a sacrament, a sign and ritual which affects what it signifies, ex opere operato, by virtue of the work accomplished. What an inestimable gift. We praise Thee, O God. Indeed, let it to damn be sung. But this life of sanctifying grace also involves, if it is genuine, a walking in the light as Paul teaches. This is the consequence, the positive task and responsibility which flows from this unmerited supernatural grace and the fruit of such a life so lived is made manifest in all goodness and righteousness and truth, as Paul notes. Hence, St. Paul goes on to admonish, take no part in the unfruitful or fruitless works of darkness. Rather, 
expose them, which implies that even though we may have received the life of sanctifying grace, we can turn away from that grace and take part in the unfruitful works of darkness. In fact, it is taking part in the unfruitful works of darkness that extinguishes the life of sanctifying grace in our soul. So what are we to do when after baptism we do in fact turn our backs upon Jesus by choosing those very fruitless works of darkness, that is mortal sin, and thereby smother, extinguish the life of grace, the light of eternal life in our souls. What are we to do when we, by our thoughts, words, and deeds, spurn the gift of spiritual sight our Lord has bestowed upon us, shun goodness, purposefully turn our backs on righteousness, deny or suppress the truth in unrighteousness, either by open hostility, presumption, or callous indifference. You may respond, when did I do this? Or in what have I done such a thing? And the immediate answer is, you personally may not have done so. But before we too easily and hastily excuse ourselves, acquit ourselves, let us, by God's grace, take a moment to recognize that the greatest threat to our souls presently, besides the residual effects of the fall in our own natures, is directly related to our culture's rejection of Catholic morality, which is to say, the natural law. Our culture's objection and hostility to the moral teaching of Christ in his church, specifically in the areas of life, sexuality, and marriage. Therefore, in the hot button issues of abortion, contraception, homosexuality, and so-called same-sex marriage. You know, that which we're being bombarded with presently. And in this regard, like the man in today's gospel, our eyes having been opened, we must always recognize that dissenting voices from within the church calling for so-called reform, voices such as those of the self-appointed group's call to action, or Catholics for choice, and the list goes on and on, and those voices outside the church, such as those of Planned Parenthood, the present administration, and the United Nations, mean by reform a surrender to our secular culture, a surrender to moral relativism and revolutionary change. Reform here meaning acceptance and approval of the evils I just spoke of, the evils of abortion, contraception, and homosexual acts, redefined as normal and as a normal way of life, which they are not and never can be in any universe. To heed these dissenting voices, to be formed by them, is actually tantamount to an inverse enculturation, which becomes a corrupting influence in the pilgrim church by holding Christ accountable to the secular culture of our time, the culture of death, rather than holding that godless culture accountable to Christ and his church. Genuine reform, the real deal, genuine renewal within our personal lives and in the pilgrim church, the kind of reform and renewal that Benedict XVI, our Holy Father Emeritus, worked for tirelessly all of his years at the Vatican and throughout his entire pontificate, and for which he is hated by the world, hated by the world's press, and even hated by some from within the church. The kind of reform we, by God's grace, are working for here at St. Elizabeth of Van Seton, within the Diocese of Fort Worth, under the leadership of Pope Francis and His Excellency Michael Olson, is rooted in not relativism, not what's popular, but 
but sanctifying grace. Regeneration, new birth, interior conversion, repentance, love of goodness, righteousness, and truth, and the personal pursuit of the same, the personal pursuit of holiness through the way of the cross. This genuine reform and renewal is not innovative, but restorative and healing. It is purifying, not experimental. It does not seek to change the perennial doctrine and moral, moral teaching of our Catholic faith, which, like its author, changes not. But rather, it seeks to change the human heart and mind that it might freely and joyfully embrace the Catholic Church's faith and morality, having embraced the Christ of the cross, all of which is not just an act of war, but an act of love. So again, I ask, what are we to do when, after baptism, mortal sin extinguishes this life of sanctifying grace, this light of eternal life in our souls, without which heaven will be lost forever to us. Don't forget that. First, we must remember, as in today's first lesson, the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God knows all. You cannot hide anything from him. In this light, this truth, we must, with the help of the Holy Spirit, illuminating our hearts and our minds, examine our consciences honestly, earnestly. And this will, in turn, lead us to the sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of penance, but not in some mechanical and lifeless, presumptive sense. You know, going there, to make myself feel better about the sins I have no intention of turning my back on. You may as well go see a movie. But with genuine heartfelt sorrow for those sins, with firm resolve to turn my back upon them and leave them behind, and then that marvelous sacrament of God's healing grace is for me and is for us after baptism the application of Christ's cleansing blood to our sin-stained souls. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. And in the words of the poet, which we can make our own, we pray, let thy blood and mercy pour let thy gracious body broken be for me, O gracious Lord, of thy tender and boundless love, the token. All of which is ours, in and through the sacrifice of Christ, once for all offered on the cross, made present in and through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. During this liturgical season of Lent, then, in and through the sacrifice of the Mass, in your war against the world, the flesh, and the devil, against those sins which so easily beset you, let meditating on Jesus Christ crucified be henceforth the heart of your daily prayer and your daily vision, your high tower, and your strong defense against the wiles and machinations of the devil. For in this battle for our souls, and that is what this is, and the souls of our children and our grandchildren, our families, the spiritual warfare, we are not contending against flesh and blood, oh no, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, like the man born blind in today's gospel, healed of your blindness, open your eyes and see Jesus and fall down and worship him. And like him, keep your eyes fixed upon your Lord and Savior, the author and finisher of your faith. Then, 
when you get up. By his healing grace, you will walk daily in the holy light of him who is goodness and righteousness and truth and who is the true and only, and I underscore only, highway to heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Shepherd.